Yo! Had some little issues there. Welcome to the stream. How you all doing? Let's see who's lurking around today at the very start. If I was on the right computer, this would help. Right, let's have a look over here. Good evening to... That's going to be a tricky, tricky one to say. Beliba Bahaba. Hello. Uh, Electrical skateboard at Finisil, Ponder Pimp, and another one. Um, R S K S E N T H I L. So Senthil, Risk Senthil. How do I pronounce your name? Uh, Sergeant Queef, hello. Um, audio and video is okay, thank you very much. All right, so this is going to be the start of a two parter uh, because originally I just wanted to cover HDR. Uh, but then when I looked into how these tutorials are structured, I realized I wanted to get to something else first. So HDR is going to be where we learn about um, using a using um, color values with a higher bit range um, and then like once we've used that higher range squeezing them back down to the 8-bit range we can put up on the screen and how we go about doing that so things look good and that gives us again enough a higher effective dynamic range I'm gonna learn about that here but um, along with all this kind of stuff, one of the things we really need to look at is gamma correction. And this is something that I've tripped up on a lot, even more than the HDR stuff. So this and um, the remapping um, up and down from like high dynamic range to low dynamic range, I think that's the tone mapping part. Um, but I think we should really cover gamma correction first. And I mean, to be honest, if I don't cover this first and I don't get this straight in my head, I don't think I'm going to get any good results in the other stuff. So basically, uh, we're going to wander through this. So if you guys could let me know if this font size is okay, because we're going to be looking at a lot of text. And um, if it's not good, let's see if I can get a bit more here, actually. There we go. If it's not good, this is going to be a very tricky stream for you. So, um, font is okay? Thank you, sir. That's great. So, um, yes, so please, other folks, do chip up, like, chirp up, whatever the word is. Let me know. Um, okay, we've got our scene from last week here. We're going to be using this to play with and try and see some of these things. This one will probably be more reading and then we'll get on to more practical stuff later. So yeah, gamma correction. I guess I can just start reading through this. Um, well, not like that. Not like this. Right, as soon as we compute all the final pixel colors of the scene, we have to d uh, display them on the monitor. It used to be to CRTs, and these monitors had this nice physical qu quality that the 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 um, if you double the input voltage. Um, oh wait a second. Oh no, that's there we go. These monitors have physical quality that twice the input voltage did not result in twice the amount of brightness. Doubling the input voltage r resulted in brightness equal to the power relationship of roughly 2.2, um, known as the gamma of the monitor. Uh, this also happens coincidentally, which is really cool, to also match up with how human beings measure brightness as brightness. And there's a there's a kind of mapping down here that we're going to get to, which describes that. But shortly, basically, this is looks to us like increments, like um, linear increments, linear steps um, of brightness. But it's actually not. This is. So this is what real life is, and this is how we see things. Um, and that difference is something that we're going to have to take account of. And I suppose we'll get to why on that soon. Um, so the top line looks like it's the correct brightness scale to the human eye, doubling in brightness from 0 to 0.2, etc. Um, it doesn't lead, look twice as bright with nice consistent differences. However, when we're talking about physical brightness, of light, i.e. the amount of photons leaving the light source, uh, the bottom scale actually creates the cor displays the correct brightness. Um, and yeah, at the bottom scale, doubling the brightness returns the correct physical brightness. But since our eyes perceive brightness differently, um, like we're more susceptible to changes in dark colors, I guess it's from the hunting side of things, it looks weird, which is true. Um, because we prefer to see things in the top scale, monitors still today use a power relationship for displaying output colors. So the original original physical brightness colors are mapped to the non-linear brightness colors in the top scale. Because it looks better. So that's all of our screens apparently are doing that. I'm guessing like anything that's doing input is going to do these conversions as well. So cameras and all that kind of stuff, which is going to matter to us. Because we're 
like especially when you're doing realistic rendering, you're taking lots of data from the real world and you're trying to display it and get things to look good. More importantly, it's going to come to when we're doing maths on this. This non-linear mapping of monitors does indeed make the brightness look better in our eyes, but when it comes to rendering graphics, there's one issue. All the color and brightness options we configure in our applications are based on what we perceive from the monitor, and thus all the options are actually non-linear brightness uh, color options. Take a look at the graph below. So, the dotted line represents the color light values in linear space, this guy here. So, yeah, one to one all the way up. Um, so this is, I guess, a doubling in, um, yeah, doubling in power versus actual brightness, I guess, or doubling in photons. Um, and the solid line represents the color space that uh, the monitors display. So this guy here. If we double a color in linear space, its result is indeed double the value. So. 0.1 to 0.2 gets us 0.2 over here. Um, oh yeah, so they're doing the example here, 0.5. Um, for instance, if we take a light colors vector, 0.5 naught naught, I guess it's up here. Um, we would double this uh, light in linear space. It would become, let's see. I'm reading that wrong. For instance, let's actually read what's on the screen, Chris. For instance, take the light's uh, color vector here, which represents a semi-dark uh, red. If we would double this light in linear space, it will become one. Sure, fine. Um, as you can see in the graph. However, um, because the colors were defined to still have the output to the monitor display, the color gets displayed on the monitor as 0 0.2. Okay, so yeah. However, because the colors uh, we defined still have to be output to the monitor display, the color gets displayed on the monitor as 0.2, as you can see from the graph. Here's where the issue starts to rise. Once we double the uh, dark red light in linear space, it actually becomes more than 4.5 times as bright on the monitor. That's nuts. So let's... Uh... Oh, I guess that's that mapping between, yeah, 0.5 here and 1 here. You can see 0.5 maps to here, just above uh, 0.2, and 1 maps to 1. That's a huge jump, even though you're doubling in this axis, you're going up 4.5 times as much in this axis. Okay, so yeah, the relationship is nonlinear. Hurrah! Um, everything like in this series of tutorials and the stuff we've been doing, pretty much, um, has assumed we're working in linear space, but we're actually working in a color space defined by the monitor's output color spaces. So all colors and lighting variables we've configured weren't physically correct, but merely looked right on our monitor because we just fudged stuff until it was all right. And well, like, especially in our streams, we haven't cared at all. We've, like, I, again, no artist was involved in the making of this series, and it really shows from what we've been doing. Um, So yeah, it's stuff that's just look right in this monitor. For this reason, we are, we and artists generally set lighting values way brighter than they should be, um, seeing as the monitor is going to darken them, depending on where on that range they are, um, which as a result makes most linear space calculations incorrect. Um, so we're trying to double the brightness of something and we're getting a very different result. Um, also note that the monitor graph and the linear graph both start and end up at the same position, and it's the intermediate colors that get darkened by the display. Because colors, as I was just saying, yeah, we get the dip here. Here and here is still the same as, as the linear relationship. Okay, because colors are... Da, 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 let's have a look. Okay, this becomes more and more, like these issues that we're talking about become more and more obvious as the advanced lighting algorithms are used, um, as you can see in the image below. So this is correcting for gamma. So basically, how I think about this, at least, so I have so far, and this is probably likely to change during this episode because um, 
this is a, this is one area I know I get wrong a lot, and I've tried to look at it before, and I felt like I understood this mapping, um, but I clearly didn't. So I've got to be careful about this stuff. So anyway, like, like we want to do math, and we're thinking our relationships between our inputs and our outputs are linear. So if we have a number and we multiply it by two, uh, then we should get a number that's twice as large. But we're seeing from here things actually mapped onto this curve automatically by the monitor. So we have something at 0.2 and we double it to 0.4 and we've actually gone from here to here, um, which is a rather different value. Uh, or more dramatically, we saw from 0.5 to 1 uh, where we went from 0.28 and by doubling we got 1. Um, so that's really off. So basically, we're going to want to get things from um, the incorrect color space into a linear space, so all our math works how we expect, and then we're going to have to get it back to um, the space that the monitor, what, like we're going to have to get it back in the color space that our eyes want to see. And yeah, I guess that's what all this is going to be about. And see, it's funny, they're, bringing up a, they're talking about a gamma correction here. They haven't actually introduced what that is yet. It's just down here. So there are differences. Okay, which one? How is it meant to look? Okay, so you can see that with gamma correction over here, um, the color values work more nicely together. Do they? I guess. And the darker areas are less dark and thus show more detail, uh, which I assume is what they were going for. Uh, this oh, this is Wolfire as well. So I love, I love the overgrowth project. It's been really fun watching that develop over the years. Happy backer of that project. Um, and they're really good because they put out articles and videos and stuff and it was just so informative as like a graphics new. Um, so let's have a look. Overall, a much better image quality with only some small modifications. Okay, so without looking cor properly, um, without properly correcting this monitor gamma, the lighting looks um, just looks wrong, and artists will have a hard time getting realistic and good-looking results. I mean, that's the thing. If if you've got a bunch of different, um, like we're, we're talking about doubling the value of something, realistically, you're going to have lots of different transformations, and if the yeah, like if the um, results coming out of them are essentially warped, then we're going to get a warped result, and so like. Yeah, we just want we want to get a sensible number line so we can start doing math on this stuff. Seems to be what we're going for. And we'll find out if I'm talking shit or not very soon. And there's some people chatting in chat, so hello. Hey Marian, good to see you. AK Graham, hello. And feel free to shout up on that amongst yourselves as well. I uh I love it as usual. Um don't feel you have to be one of the regular gang to start nattering, because you're all really welcome here. Um, okay. So the solution apparently is to apply gamma correction. Magic! That's what we're going to look at first. So the idea of gamma correction is to apply the inverse of the monitor's gamma, gamma to the final output value before displaying it to the monitor. So back here, this is the inverse. So to the power of 1.2, sorry, 1 over 2.2, sorry words um looking back at the gamma uh curve graph earlier this section sorry earlier this section earlier in this section we see another dashed line that, it, that is the inverse of the monitor's gamma curve we multiply each of the linear color outputs by this inverse gamma curve making them brighter um and as soon as the colors are displayed on the monitor the monitor's gamma curve is applied um and the resulting colors become linear. Basically, we make the intermediate colors brighter, so as soon as the monitor darkens them, it balances out. So we're going to work in linear space, so we can do our multiplications and all that kind of stuff like we'd expect, and then we're going to push it out so it is just the right kind of shape that is going to be pushed back into um, linear when it's displayed to the screen. So we're just we're, we're counteracting that uh, gamma curve from the monitor, which is interesting. And all because of CRTs and RIs. So before displaying this color to the monitor, we first apply the gamma correction curve to the color value. 
Linear colors are displayed by a monitor. Oh, wait a second. Just worth checking to see if... No. Nah. Just making sure that none of the uh, this stuff was relying on some JavaScript I disabled. Linear colors displayed by monitor roughly scaled to a power of 2.2. Um, so the inverse requires scaling colors uh, by a power of 1 over 2.2. Fair enough. So we're going to raise all our colors to the power of 1 over 2.2. And that's going to go... And that's it. That's the general idea, I believe. Well, that's the general approach to getting it done. The gamma corrected dark red color thus becomes um, 0 0.5. Oh, so this is this, uh, yeah, the dark red we were talking about earlier. We're going to raise it to the power of 1 over 2.2. And we're going to get 0 0.73. So we've brightened it a bit. And then what is going to happen is the monitor is going to... Um, what is it going to do? Yeah, of course, it's going to raise it to the power of 2.2, which is going to darken it again. So it gets back into the, the uh, linear place. You can see by using gamma correction, the monitor now finally displays the colors we linearly set them in the application. Cool. So all this is about just saying we want the colors that we, the numbers we put out, we want those accurately represented on the screen. But we know that the screen is going to do this to them. So if we bump them out this way, then when it does, tries to do this manipulation, it's actually going to land back on this line here. So we've remapped out so it can be remapped back. Um, and then we can say actually what the values are going to be directly. And we're going to just have to make sure then that we present things in a way that is uh, visually correct for people. So that's going to be interesting too. Because, yeah, I mean, like, colors still need to be um, in that nonlinear range because of the way eyes work, right? So that's what they were saying in the beginning. Dum, 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 dum. People see things in this scale when actually uh, real life is in this scale. Um, Cool. Okay. The income following so far. Alright, so yeah, we're going to raise things to the power of 1 over 2.2. So, I mean, I can guess we can do that straight away. What I might do is I might uh, disable this um, vignette we've got going on here. Because it is darkening things a little. And seeing as we're talking about color, um, that kind of matters to us right now. So, are we doing the radial blur stuff? Is this being used? There's one way we can check. No, we're not using this right now. In the current pipeline, at least. Oh yeah, it's being uh, applied in our uh, FXAA here. So let's just remove that. And recompile. That's odd. That is still there. Oh. Wait a second. Oh, yeah, I broke something earlier. Never mind. We should actually run this. Good, okay. So, before we had the, vi the vignette, excuse me. Yeah, then we had the kind of shading around the edges. And we take that off, and we've got this kind of bright, aggressive thing going on here. Cool, okay. And then the idea is... We're going to be raising things to the power of 1 over 2.2. So, whoops. Raising this to the power of 1 over 2.2. Whoops. Yeah, okay. I didn't know exponent, didn't like that. Maybe power is okay with it at least. A lot of the GL ones that have more overloads than the uh, common list ones, at least. So let's abort that and recompile. Oh no, doesn't like that either. That feels like something is missing from this. Like um, one second, GLSL pow. I bet that's supported in GLSL and just not in Vario. Gen type, gen type, gen type. Yep, that's a mistake. I need to add that to. Um, I need to add that to Vario. 
Let's just file an issue for this quickly. One second. Actually, instead of Vario, it's going to be GLSL spec. And in here. Whoops. How is missing sign overloads? That'd be really easy to add. If someone wants to do that, they're more than welcome. Um, but yeah. So anyway, let's uh, hope at least I haven't been an idiot and... Um, Okay, so there we go. So we've taken this VEC3, which is the color coming out of this function, the FXAA function, and we have um, raised it to the power of uh, 1 over 2.2. So this is now linearly corrected. So if we were doubling colors in here, they should be double the amount of photons coming out of the screen. However, our eyes aren't going to enjoy that so much, I guess. I mean, that was the whole point, right? We, we The screen deforms the colors... <laughs> Ugh. This is where I always get this shit messed up in my head. I just want to have a look again. So, at the very beginning, like the CRTs, that twice the input voltage did not uh, result in twi twice the brightness. Uh, doubling the input voltage re resulted in the brightness equal to the power relationship of roughly 2.2, known as the gamma of the monitor. So when they doubled the amount of voltage to the CRT, uh, they got the brightness that the human eyes liked, basically. But that messes with our um, messes with our math because when we're doubling values, um, when we're doubling yeah color values and expecting one thing, the human eye is getting something very different. Um, because of the gamma correction. So do we do this first and then do our math? We do it in this other space so then it gets transformed back to linear? Gotta have to see. I thought it was something we did at the end. Yeah, to so the final output color before displaying to the monitor. Okay, so let's carry on. Um, dun, 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 dun. We went through this. A gamma value of 2.2 .2 is a default gamma value that roughly e um, estimates the average gamma on most displays. The color space um, as a result of this gamma um, of 2.2 .2 is called sRGB um, color space. Each monitor has their own gamma curves, but a gamma curve of 2.2 .2 gives the results from good results on most monitors. Um, so, when we make our games, we better add a setting for this, but we'll use 2.2 uh, as a default. Interesting. So, this corrected. So, the color space as a result of this gamma is 2.2, .2, and it's called the sRGB space. So, this one down here is our sRGB space. Okay, so there are two ways of applying gamma correction to your scenes by using OpenGL's uh, built in sRGB frame buffer support cool i didn't know they had that um or by doing the gamma correction ourselves in the fragment shaders that's what we did just a second ago over here by raising it to the power of 1 over 2.2 we've done our gamma correction um the first option is probably the easiest but it gives you the well it gives you less control by enabling uh gl frame buffer srgb you tell OpenGL that the subsequent drawing commands should be first be um Sorry, subsequent drawing commands should first gamma correct colors, okay, from the sRGB color space before storing them in color buffers. Um, yeah. So we can just call GL, um, well, let's try this actually. Well, I see the results, so let's Paste that there for a second, and then we'll fix it up. So it's going to be GL enable. Oops. No. Oh. Never mind. And we don't need the GL here. 
So I think what we'll start with is we'll remove this tweak we did. This is our fixing of, uh, this is our mapping color space. So this is what we had originally. Then we enable this. Framebow SRGB is not defined as a keyword enum. Oh, that's weird. Continue. Let's go see what we've, uh, what's going on in there. There's so a seal open GL bindings. Enum. Um, yeah, export enum. Where is that defined then? Crap. Enum. Define. Compile the macro enum equals. No. It's going to be like def foreign or something like this. CFI. Hmm. I thought there was something just called enum in here. I'm going to have to have a look down here and see what we've got. Nope. But anyway, there's a lot of things being exported here. Let's see if our um, SRGB is in here somewhere. Nope. Let's just search for it. SRGB. That's more likely to be easy to find. Constants. Okay, this is a big old enum. I bet this is the proper GL enum here. Um, oh no. This is... Oh no, here we go. Enum. There it is. Def C enum. That was what it was called. All right. So we are looking for frame buffer sRGB. So frame buffer sRGB. Oh, so it's there. But it did not like us using it with uh, with GL enable. How strange. Go have a look at this function, see what we've got. Takes a number of uh, things and that calls GL enable on that. Interesting. Yeah, so we're taking a capability. That should be fine. Very strange. Oh, I'm an idiot. Here we go. It's, it's hyphen instead of underscore. Right, enable is unbound. Yes, it's because you're an idiot and you can't type, Chris. There we go. Right, okay, so that's what we wanted to see. So the first way of dealing with, whoo, no. With the, um, with things being out transformed into sRGB space um, is to tell the frame buffer that's meant to be sRGB and then it's gonna do that inverse uh, manipulation on it and then it will be correct like when the monitor does its srgb remapping then we're going to get things in uh, linear color space so by enabling that um, we can do disable to turn it back to how it was enable disable right now i'm going to enable it and i'm going to try and do two things at once we'll do program hmm actually no we probably can't <laughs> never mind oh actually yeah let's do a bit of hackery here so if we just say Progen and paste this here and wrap it around this block. And then we're going to, um, was this the right shader? It doesn't feel like the right shader. Hold on. Which buffer were we in, Chris? Right, oh, here we are, here we are, okay. What I want to do, what I'm, I wanna do is disable it and enable R thing at the same time, just to see if they are the same. So we've enabled it, it's on. And then we're gonna do program to disable it. And yeah, we're gonna do program, disable it. And then we're gonna recompile this at the same time. And we're gonna to switch to R implementation, which is just raising to the power of one over 2.2. So if we're lucky, when, when this flashes, nothing should change over here. Fuck you. All right, okay. Um, that is because, fun of funds, um, 
Are we actually... Uh... No, we're still running. Good. The REPL is running in a different thread than the compiler might. When you do a control C, control C over here, you don't know what thread you're going to be running on. You're, well, you're going to be running on the worker thread that Slime has set up for you, um, which is rather annoying. So this isn't going to work. Um, damn it. So all we're going to do is we're going to go, just keep that in mind. We'll go here, we'll go back over here, and we'll recompile, and we get the same thing. So manually correcting, uh, doing gamma correction, and then automatically doing gamma correction. So now to see why. Oh, by the way, just so you know, um, even though you've got those threading problems, Capital takes care of that when you're doing recompilation. So when you control C, control C on these, even though it's going to recompile um, your shaders and stuff, it's doing that on the right thread. And it just basically just delegates to the next draw. Um, and so the next draw on each thread is going to do recompiles there as appropriate. It works. It took a while to get it to work exactly right because there's values you're setting various places, but it does work. So let's see what good shit talking's going on over here. Um, Pond of him saying that regular gang seemed to be a rough team at first. Yeah, you guys, he's lovely. AK Karam Rufti. I was expecting a lot worse when I started streaming. Um... <laughs> Rule one, don't change the regular gang. Fuck you, Pound Pip, I'll let in who I like. Um... <laughs> Karam saying, go is much better than Lisp. Am I doing this right? You are. You are. Uh, what? So, AK Karam saying, why aren't drivers doing gamma correction, by the way? Um, why should it be a per game setting? Well, I mean, gamma correction is a thing that you want, and it's being done by the monitor, not by the um, the driver. That's yeah, it's actually in this guy, which I'm knocking on and damaging the screen. So don't do that. Um, if the value depends on the monitor anyway, that is a, there is a reasonable question. It would be nice if because the drivers would still have to get that value from somewhere. So you would have to have, like, the really the monitor should report that gamma value to the driver, and then the driver could report it back to, you know, us. Um, that would be nice, but I don't think that's how it is. Maybe there is a way of doing that. If you, uh, if you know of any libraries for doing that, that would be really cool to see. Um, also, you can't rely on what people have done to their monitors since they've got them as well. Um... One of them's giving me shit for knocking my screen. Yeah, and I'm still pointing on it too, like you say. Yep. I'm good at this. Doesn't matter. Like, we've been doing this for over a, well, well over a year now. And I'm still, still fucking rubbish at this. Oh, well. I still get to see you folks every week, so I'm doing something right. Okay. So we tried this, and then we went back to our way of doing it, which we're going to see down here. So from now on, your rendered images will be gamma corrected. And this is done um, by the hardware. Oh yeah, and as it's done by the hardware, it's completely free. Something you should keep in mind uh, with this approach and the other approach is that gamma correction also transforms the colors from linear space to non-linear space. So it's very important to only do gamma correction at the last and final step. Um, if you gamma correct your colors before the final output, all subsequent operations on those colors will operate on incorrect values. So, for instance, if you use multiple frame buffers and you, you probably want intermediate results passed in between frame buffers to remain in linear space and only have the last frame buffer apply gamma correction before being sent to the monitor. Cool. Uh, there's another thing that I guess we're going to get to. Yeah, textures. Okay, well, I'll leave that because we're going to have to talk about that soon as well. Um, the second approach requires a bit more work, but also gives us complete control over gamma operations. We apply gamma correction at the end of each relevant fragment state, uh, shader, so um, the final colors end up being gamma corrected before sent to the monitor. So here we go, pow, from RGB to... Oh! Oh! Why is he transforming to a VEC3? I'm an idiot. I actually... Th this is not an issue. That uh, GLSL spec thing. This is a. Uh, whoops. Invalid. Um, Thanks, gen type. Oh. Oh, come on. Gen type and float. 
Yeah, if we look at this again, it takes a gen type and a gen type, which will be either a float and a float, a vec2 and a vec2, a vec3 and a vec3, a vec4 and a vec4, but you can't mix and match with gen types. This is a really fucking annoying, like, it's okay from a human point of view, this notation, but as someone who's trying to, like, make this work in the compiler, this shit is pain in the ass. I don't like gen types. They're not a, they're not a fun, <laughs> they're not a fun type to work with, because every gen type in the thing has to be the same kind. Blech. But anyway, so yeah, this takes a vec3 and a vec3 and returns a vec3. So, we did have to transform this into a vec3. That was the correct thing to do. So easy to assume. Once you start building enough of the stack, you just assume that you fucked up everywhere. Uh, okay, yeah. So, we take the color. We raise it to the power of 1 over 2.2. The gamma. An issue with this approach is that in order to be consistent, you have to apply gamma correction to each fragment shader that contributes to the final result. So if you have a dozen fragment shaders for multiple objects, you have to add the gamma correction code to each of these shaders. The easy solution would be to introduce a post-processing stage in your render loop and apply gamma correction on the post-process quad as a final step. There is always going to be post-processing you're doing. If you're doing, say, FXAA, it would be good to do it after that, like right in that shader. Actually, exactly what we're doing here. We apply the FXAA. Um, here and then we apply gamma correction before spitting it out to the screen. Okay. These one liners represent a technical implementation of gamma correction. Not all too impressive, but there are a few extra things you have to consider when doing gamma correction. Cool. So let's do one thing actually. Let's um, put this in a function. Defund g game correct gamma correct. Or correct gamma. And we'll take a color, which is a vec3. And we're going to paste this, take our color, and raise it to the power of 1 over 2.2. Um, you could do this, I suppose. Which will compute this at uh, read time and then we'll just be doing vec3 of that but your compilers your glsl compiler is going to flatten this out anyway it's going to look at both of these see their constants do the divide probably on the compile and then come in here that'll be interesting i wonder when that de delegates that to anyway let's do correct gamma and then we can just call correct gamma here and nothing changes because everything worked and uh, just to show that things are still running, there we go. Yeah, so that's our correct gamma function. I wonder if EXPTU does work on this. Yeah, it does. Okay, I'm going to leave it like that because it's a little lispier. A little more familiar when I'm thinking in Lisp to have it with that function. Okay, so first part is we have been doing math assuming that 2 times 2 equals 4. But uh, due to the post-processing that the monitor does on your colors, um, you get different results than that. So you have one block of color that is like at 0.3 and another block of color right next to it that's 0.6. And you're expecting um, those things to be, again, double perceptually in color, but they've been transformed. Um, so that wasn't actually the case. So now what we're doing is we're manipulating our colors just before we hand them out of our control um, to the rest of the pipeline and thus up to our monitor. And we're pushing them about so that when the monitor transforms them, they remain linear um, when they're on the screen. And that's kind of correctness is going to allow us to have, yeah, is to control more things more accurately as we're doing stuff. I think that's what they're saying. I think. Every time I say it, though, I feel very unconfident about it. So, um... <laughs> yeah we'll see ah it's only 840 we got loads of time awesome so srgb textures okay so because monitors always display colors with gamma applied um whenever you draw edit or paint a picture on your computer you are picking colors based on what you see on the monitor right so we're looking at the monitor and we see a color and we're like that's the one we want um and then we paint with that or we edit an image with that we're using photoshop whatever 
This effectively means that all pictures you create or edit are not in linear space, but in sRGB space. Of course, we, we, we color things based on what we see. So they're all going to be wrong because our eyes are wrong. Like from a from a math from a relationship between colors point of view, if we see things as being double as bright, they're not double as bright in terms of photons, and thus, yeah, our math is going to be incorrect. So as a result, texture artists create all of your textures in sRGB space. sRGB space. So if we want to use those textures in our in our application, we're going to have to take this into account. So before we apply gamma correction. Okay, so like before we applied gamma correction, this was not an issue because we designed them incorrectly and then we displayed them equally incorrectly. So it was fine. Um, so uh, da -da -da -da, because the textures looked uh, so good in SRG, sRGB space and without gamma correction, uh, we also worked in sRGB space. So the textures were displayed exactly as... Um, as they are, which was fine. Okay. However, now that we're displaying everything in linear space, the texture colors will be off, as shown in the following image. This is again these kind of things. Like, I really appreciate that the images are put in there, but it's like both of these lighting situations could be correct based on different lights. So it's like, yeah, this is fine. Okay, I trust you, but it's kind of odd. I don't know how you meant to show that kind of stuff. It's tricky. The texture images are way too bright, and this happens because we're actually gamma correcting twice. <laughs> when we create an image based on what we see on the monitor, we're effectively we effectively gamma correct the color values of an image that so that it looks right on the monitor. Because we then again add gamma correct in the renderer, like the, that st stuff we just added, the images will be way too bright. Okay. Uh, to fix this issue, we're going to have to make sure artists work in linear space. However, it's seen as most texture artists don't even... Oh, that's a bit unfair. Don't know what gamma correction is. I think a lot of texture artists know exactly what gamma correction is. Um, I think the main point is it's easier to work here. This is like you want to work in a place where your eyes are giving you good results. So you're going to want to work in sRGB space. The other solution is to recorrect or transform these sRGB textures back into linear space before doing any calculations. So basically, yeah, like when we um, when we load things, we know we're loading them um, with like, with uh, values that are based on human perception, so they're going to be incorrect. We will correct them into linear space. So then we can do math with them. We can actually use them in our functions. And then um, knowing that they're linear, we manipulate them again. So when the monitor manipulates them, they'll still stay linear. So we're just trying to keep all our relationships right here. Whew. It's at both ends of the pipeline. So they're saying when you sample a texture, you should also be raising that to um, power of, yeah. Ah, the power of gamma. So now instead of inverse gamma, we're doing it the other way. So let's go and let's go and do this. Right. So def constant gamma, which is going to be two point two, and what we're going to do um, is we're defining just a regular Lisp constant here because Keppel and well Vario and thus Keppel. Um, knows how to inline uh, constants uh, if it can work out the type. So obviously it's going to look at this and see that this is a single float. Um, we can make extra sure of that uh, here. What am I doing? And then instead of this 2.2 here, we're going to use gamma. And then just to be sure that we got the right thing, we can go and say full G um, color gamma back three. And we can see here that it's used 2.2, which is correct. That's a bit better. Nice. Okay.
Oh, for those who are wondering, when we pull a, um, a, G a GPU function like this, um, it first, it compiles it to GLSL and then shows you the result. However, the GLSL compiler works on stages, um, not just single functions. So it, it uses your function um, in a dummy stage. And here, rather than coming up with some correct, vec like, correct value in the type that you asked for, it just makes a dummy value. So here is a dummy value being passed into uh, this function. And thus we get the source code. It's important, like based on various transformations that are gonna go on the compiler that, yeah, we're passing things in and compiling them correctly. Yep. And we're compiling it as a vertex stage because it'll work there. Nice. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's look at this again. So. We're going to raise the colors coming out of our textures to the power of 2.2. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Just trying to get this straight in my head. So basically, all of our textures we're loading in have been gamma corrected already, so we've got to undo that to get make them linear. And then we do all our math, this is in our shader, and at the end we do the inverse to get out here again so that then the transform is going to bring it back here. So because we're working, basing things off our eyes, we're painting things, all of our things are... Is it incorrect? See, I would have thought that if our eyes are perceiving things this way, Hmm. Of course, the file is going to store them gamma corrected, so when they're displayed, they get warped. Is that right? Ah, uh, nope. This is where I get a little, a little fuzzy around here. So let's let's go back here and keep working through. Might need to look up something else just to see if different wording helps me with this. Um, let's check what's going on in chat. Because you probably know what's going on. I wonder if I'm saying, yeah, the side-by-side -side comparison is a bit confusing because it might depend on the properties of the texture, etc. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a tricky one. But like, what do you do? AK Graham says I'm looking at my games with my 80s red, blue, 3D glasses. <laughs> Demand games be correct for that. That's awesome. That's just a nice shader to do. Maybe that's one we should do sometime. A 3D um, red-green thing. You just render the scene twice. And then do one in red and one in thing and overlap them. I guess that's it. That's all we need to do. Slightly offset. Actually, that would be quite fun. We might have to do that. I guess you, you have two cameras a certain distance apart. But always pointing at the same point. And then just display like blend both of those. Like a 50-50 blend. That could be quite fun. <laughs> Karam saying, yeah, I'm wearing them all the time so I can look at two buffers at Emacs at the same time. <laughs> that would be amazing. Oh, I love that idea. My mate's getting those for, uh, at some point in the future, he's doing a Virtual Boy demo. And so obviously when displaying on a big screen, He's gonna have to do the like do it in two colors and give everyone the glasses. That's gonna be dope. <laughs> I can't wait to see that. Um, da -da 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 -da. Where are we? Okay. Okay, so we were down here. To do this for each, we need coffee. I need coffee. If you don't need coffee, you're a different animal than me. Do this for each texture in sRGB space is quite troublesome though. Luckily, OpenGL gives us yet another solution by giving us the S GL sRGB texture. So, if we create a, a texture in OpenGL with either of the uh, any of these uh, any of these two either of these two sRGB texture formats specified, OpenGL will automatically correct 
the colors to linear space as soon as we use them, allowing us to properly work in linear space with all color values extracted. Uh, we can specify a texture as an sRGB texture as follows. Yeah, so for us in, in Keppel, normally we would do uh, make texture initial contents uh, would be nil dimensions are going to be I don't know doesn't really matter in this case let's just say 100 no let's do it um, 64 by 64 why don't I even think about that it's, it's an example who gives a shit anyway uh, and then when we set the element type we have a bunch of options so we can either use the um, names that are specified by GL. So um, RGBA is not the thing I was looking for actually. RGBA8 I think is the one. Yeah. So um, this is, it has four components. So X, Y, Z, W, so RGBA. Um, each of them is eight bits. Uh, so you're storing that 0 to 256. When we're working with them in textures, we're normally working with a float between 0 and 1. So it's an 8-bit normalized... Is it normalized? 8-bit normalized float? I think that's correct. Um, it's an 8-bit float anyway. Um, oh no, wait a second. No, we... Like, it gets... Oh, see, this is like trying to be precise on this without the spec. I get really kind of edgy about. Anyway, we can specify them in the GL formats or we can specify them in Lisp formats. Like we can have a 64 by 64 float texture um, or a VEC3 texture. If we inspect this texture, we can see that the actual format it ended up using was an RGB 32-bit float texture because that's what this type is in uh, in Capel. It's a yeah three component 32-bit per component float. Um, if we want to spe specify something equivalent to this, um, the type we can use is vec3. What was it? Really? Um, uint 8 vec3 yeah there we go so when we go and look at that we can see it's an rgb8 or we can say uint 8 vec4 is an rgba8 so that's the equivalent of this one it depends if you're more familiar like if you're more thinking about things in the types that we're mentioning and using say from rtg math or things like that or if you're more think or, or CFFI in terms of UNA and stuff like this, or if you're more thinking about things in terms of the GL names. Uh, we just allow conversions between. If you're ever kind of in a situation where you're trying to work out what one goes to another one, um, you can use, um, it's in, um, this is in Keppel of course, you have a Lisp type to um, image format, and you can say int, and it doesn't know how to do that. But if you give it int 8, it's going to say it's an RGBAS norm. Um, uint 8 is an R8. Um, float goes into an R32F. So it's things like this. You can just whack in types and you can see what they're meant to be. It can also be handy to go from the type to the pixel format. This guy will describe a lot of things for you about the um, type. This is a, a format we use inside Keppel so we can generate the uh, pixel upload and pixel download um, commands. It has all the information here that you need to work out what you're gonna do there. Um, what else? Oh yeah, also um, if you have a pixel format and you want to get to a um, image format, you don't do that with VEC3. But we can take this pixel format we just had and convert it back. So you've got functions that go from pixel formats to image formats, image formats to pixel formats, and the same between Lisp types and either of those. Like whenever someone asks me about um, texture stuff, especially upload stuff, I always go to Keppel and just use those functions because it took me a fucking month to get them right, and then I never want to think about it ever again. It really pisses me off. It's I just get so confused. Um, 
Hold on him. Did he say Virtual Boy? Fuck yes. You should be checking out Ferris's streams. Uh, that dude's been doing a, vir a uh, Virtual Boy emulator for a good year or so. It's, it's awesome. So um, I need to check on his streams as well. I haven't been watching for a while. Um, it's dope. Medellin saying the make texture doesn't work here in the REPL. What, what did you put in? If you can just paste in chat what you put in and the error, I'll tell you what was going on there. Okay, so the idea is, oh yeah, sRGB. So what we're going to do instead of doing make texture um, with an RGB texture, ah uh, no, instead of an RGB eight, I'm not sure if I support straight sr straight RGB, even though it should implicitly be an RGB eight. Anyway, we're going to do sRGB eight, and this texture will every time we read from this texture, it's going to raise it the value to the power of two point two. So then it's in linear space. And that will be fine. Then we can do math with it. And then we can transform it. So that the monitor will do its <laughs> final transform. Man. Okay, so if we if we create the texture in OpenGL with any either of these. Oh yeah, we already read that bit. We can specify it as follows. And there's the normal RGB thing. If you want to include an alpha component in your texture, you'll have to specify the texture's internal format as sRGB alpha. So we can just do sRGB A. Ooh. This is also a really shit error. Um, so I'm just going to report an issue for that now. Because I really hate that. That should be giving you... There's no excuse for not... Uh, for not giving you an error there. Make texture with unknown um, element type gives a confusing error message. Okay, so SRGBA. Oh dear. I hope I support those formats. I must do. Let's go. I'm just going to quickly dip into Keppel and see what we support. So it'll be um, types, maybe? Image format? SRGB? SRGB8? Oh, SRGB up. Oh, yeah, they did actually fucking said it. Okay, if you do what you're told, it works. Funny that, Chris. Okay, and let's see what Medellin had. Um, attempted to register texture before ID fully initialized. Interesting. Have you um, run Keppel REPL yet? Like, has it created a, a window with a context and stuff? Because that could be it. If you haven't initialized GL essentially before doing that make texture. That's weird though because what it should do. Keppel should cache that operation and give you an invalid texture. And then when the... Okay, you're saying yes to that. So yes, the thing is definitely started. Attempting to register texture before ID fully initialized. That's a shame. If you could, um, yeah, feel free to raise an issue on Keppel for that, and I'll look into it just with the the uh, code snippet that you used. Raise it on Keppel, and I'll um, I'll look into that. Oh, well, with the error as well, obviously. Just copy paste stuff out of the um, the error like log thing that you get in Emacs, sorry, and uh, the code that you used. Put that in issue. I'll I'll happily have a dig, see what it is. It could be a uh, like a GL version thing. Um, actually, if you could run. Let's see if I can remember it. 
uh, Keppel is something to do with GL. Yeah. Oh, it's not version float then, because it's going to want something. Is that Keppel context? Yeah. If you can run just version float with Keppel context and take the number and put that in the error report as well, um, that would be really good to know. Because I don't know what it is. Sorry about that, mate. We will get into what that is soon. And I will get back to doing some actual support. I, I looked at a couple of tickets last week, but then I got back into working again. And um, I haven't really surfaced in that much. Okay, so. Okay, you should be careful when specifying your textures in sRGB spaces. Not all textures will actually be in sRGB space. Arr. Textures used for coloring objects like diffuse textures are almost always in sRGB space. Oh, okay, yeah, of course. Textures used for retrieving lighting parameters such as specular maps and use uh, normal maps are almost always in linear space. That makes perfect sense. You're not painting those by hand. Um, or you shouldn't be. If you were to configure these as sRGB, I suppose actually you could, but it would have to be that like the authoring application is then going to put it in store in linear space anyway, so it'd be fine. If you were to configure these as sRGB textures as well, the lighting will break down. Be careful in which textures you specify sRGB. That makes sense. Okay, with our diffuse textures specified as sRGB textures, you now get the visual output you expect again. But this time, everything is gamma corrected only once. So, it would be really nice if we had some uh, some example textures we could use that we know are. Well, I suppose if these ones are like these were authored in normal authoring programs, so these are going to be incorrectly done. So maybe we can just do that. Like maybe we can fix that ourselves. Um, Let's, what are we going to do? I suppose we look at, what was it called? Assets. Now we have function called text. I'm going to rename this get text actually. Let's just do a bit of, a bit of fucking around. Is there anything called text? Yeah, save. No, good. And there's gonna be something called text like this. All right. So what we need to do is in the text function, when we're loading things, we want to store this in an, S, in an sRGB8 texture. Now there's, I'm not sure if dirt supports that. Let's go and have a look. It's passing this to, oh yeah, we can actually just pass in an image format that's given to Okay, so it loads image to CRA um, using soil, which is good. And it always does that in RGBA, cool. And then it makes a texture. Um, specifying the image format as whatever we pass in. So if we just change this to sRGB, no, RGB8. What's it? RGBA fucking SRGBA alpha. That was it? Something like that. We had this a second ago, you knob. What was it? Yeah, SRGB8. Alpha 8, cool. And then if we do something like text, and then we call, and that's the thing, currently there, this thing has cached a load of samplers. So let's go and inspect that. Here they are here. So what we should do is we should free all these 
and then um, clear the hash table. Oh, fuck it. We'll just leak the memory. Don't care about it. Clear this. Every time now we um, we load something new in, let's go with dirt.jpg. Invalid path name? Really? Oh, oh yeah, because it's meant to be project relative. So, um, like this. Okay, so this guy now, if we look at it, is going to be a sampler with a texture which is in srgb8 alpha 8 image format. Cool. That's done. So we really need to reload all the objects. Um, let's go and see where that's done. I think that's just done, you know, project with reset. Um, we go through and we make 10 boxes and 10 balls. So if we look at this, it's calling make instance on box. And um, we don't need to look at the definition for make instance, but we can look at the definition for box, um, which is a sampler, which is going to use text to get its uh, sampled texture. So yeah, that should work. Let's just do a reset then. And really? Okay, right. So these colors now look like, let's go and get the uh, scratched color up like this. I'm going to zoom in here. These look similar again. So when we were loading them in, uh, they were looking a bit bright before because our gamma correction was pushing them to be bright. Um, so when we load them in, uh, we darken them a bit. Is that the right way around? They were looking too light. Yes, because we're essentially gamma correcting twice. I think that's it. Ah. No, because... Okay, right. When it loads them in, it raises them to the power of 2.2. Which is going to make them darker. Because the value is between 0 and 1. And any time you multiply... Every time you raise a number to a power that's less than 1, it's going to be making it smaller. Um... So yeah, that would have been making it darker. And yes, we made it darker so that when we gamma correct on the way out, it's going to be correct again. Yeah, we pushed it into linear space. Is that correct? Because that would mean that it was originally in... Um, no. Yeah, so the image will be stored like this. When we load it, we're raising it to the power of 2, which makes it linear. And then we raise it to the power of 1 over 2.2 to push it out here again, so that when the monitor does the gamma correction, well, when the, when the monitor does its final uh, transform, because LCDs have to match how CRTs worked, because that's how everything is authored, then we're back at linear again. Okay. I think, I think I get that. Um... I'm just trying to get straight in my head again how that when people are authoring stuff, they're looking at a monitor that is correcting things. To how humans see stuff. When people think they're doubling a value. Oh, man, it just... The intuition just isn't coming yet, which is really annoying. I'm just trying to make... like just trying to work out in my head how when people are looking at stuff when they're doing the numbers, so they think, oh, it's, yeah, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. Um, for that to look like doubles. So, okay, but they had something at, like, the... At 3... And they had it at six. And so because they're working in this space. Is that right? Then their value is actually way more than double. And when it's saved. Nope. No, nope, it was gone again. Oh, fuck. That's really annoying. Oh, the other thing is attenuation. So this isn't really related to gamma correction, is it? Oh, okay, it's affected by gamma creation it is light attenuation. In the real world, um, lighting attenuates closely 
um, inversely proportional to the squared distance from the light source. So yeah, one over distance squared. However, when you're using uh, this attenuation, the effect is way too strong, giving lights a small radius that doesn't look physically right. Oh, that's good. That's what that is then. Uh, for that reason, other attenuation functions were used when we discuss, discussed basic lighting. Ah, so yes, when we did basic lighting, or at least I, I did some of these tutorials ages like a year or so. Anyway, I can't remember how long it was ago. A while. Um, we had a fall off like one over distance. Actually, there's probably some... Are we doing any distance fall off here for our point lights? I don't think we are, actually. I think we're just doing a directional... Um, like on this side. There's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of... Um, ambient light in this scene as well so there's not much uh shadow you can see there but there is some but i don't think we did any fall off i think we just took the dot product of um light direction and normal and used that times some value da -da -da -da. so this linear result looks way better um, without gamma correction but when we enable gamma correction, the result, um, the linear atten attenuation looks too weak, and the physically correct quadratic attenuation suddenly gives the better results. So I mean, that's the really nice, um, yeah. Without gamma correction quadratic, quadratic, which is too tight, so we would use with gamma correction quadratic. No, sorry, we would use. We would use uh, linear, which gave nicer spots. Yeah, this is just a tricky scene to learn things from. But then when you add gamma correction, suddenly everything's very washed out and you want to go back to using the quadratic one again. Basically, once you start doing, um, like using, using gamma correction properly, you're able to use the formula that actually describe the real world in your games to a certain degree. Um, because... You're now modeling things in the way that they are in the real world. So suddenly you can use all that information that's been gathered over the years for that kind of stuff. Which is important when you're looking at uh, things like physically based rendering. Um, so yeah, there's that. Let's have a look at what's going on here. Yeah, you're using a version 4.1 metagan that, sh that should definitely support everything we're doing um i think i'm using 4.1 in my linux machine no no this is my linux machine shit no this is 4.5 it's 4.6 i haven't got yet um pom de pimp saying there's a nice uh, video about um by carmack about lighting for those who want to learn a bit about that that's cool yep the 2013 quakecon Lecture, yeah, he gives does some good stuff in that. I really love. Oh man, yeah, I could go off on a rent there. Had some great, um, very pragmatic views on functional programming in games as well, which is really nice. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah, so we basically hit the end of this, which is good. And this is the bit I really need to get into my head. Um, let's have a look at at the bottom. So this was learnopengl.com in their advanced lighting section, gamma correction. Um, and I will be, thanks to Pond the Pimp for pressuring me a bit last week. I don't think I got back to you. Um, about your email last time or, or a message wherever it was uh, point of it. Uh, but what I wanted to say was uh, you're absolutely right as far as I, I it really is valuable to get these links into the videos um, but when I thought about it I felt really lazy and I don't want to make anyone else do that and I really appreciate your offer but I'm going to make sure that the videos get links in them um, and I'm sorry that's taken me so long uh, the last week's one should have been very well linked if there was anything missing let me know um, and I'll start doing that every week 
continuing. So thank you very much. I needed a bit of push on that. Okay, so down the bottom here, apparently there's some good links. So let's have a look at this. What every coder should know about Gamma. So I don't think I'll bore you by reading all of this on stream as well. It's that last bit, that last little bit I'm struggling with is, uh, what the fuck? The way this is linked is really annoying. Oh no, it has actually gone out to a different tab. What the fuck? Oh, so it's just my system that's being weird here. Okay. Um, the last bit I'm struggling with in my head, because I totally get the... Um, like CRTs um, had a non-linear um, color response curve on them. And that meant that basically they darkened images, but they darkened images in a way that just so happened to line up with how humans see stuff. So twice the voltage ended up looking perceptionally, perception-wise, human perception-wise, twice the brightness, which was really cool property. Um, when LCDs rolled around, they kept that same property. And so, and, th and that means every all the content that had been authored so far was all going to match up. Um, and that, that makes sense. So, as a service, as a benefit to the user, all LCDs do this transform to behave in the same way um, that a CRT would. Uh, with the same input. But, well, yeah, with the same color input. Um, that I get my head around, no problem. And I get that, obviously, um, this is a problem for us because um, we expect our numbers to have a linear relationship. If you were, uh, like, yeah, if you start multiplying things, like by two, you expect the value you get out to be twice as large. Um, so if you put a color that's 0 0.1 and then a color 0 0.2, um, you expect 0 0.2 to be twice as bright as 0 0.1. Um, but that hasn't been happening because of this transform. So... See if I can get this right. Getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, could you put the current week's links in play with Vert's Lisp? That's not a bad idea either, actually. I could just shove it in the repo as well. Um, yeah, I'll do that, mate. I'll do that. Thanks, mate, again. That's a good idea. Um, for Yeah, I suppose we can throw in this one, because this is the one we're working off today. This is where we are. Let's close this. And then, um, That's our gamma correction code done. Okay, so. So 
Let's go down to textures again, because that's, I guess, the place I'm still a little... Like, I know something when I can teach it. And most of these streams, like a lot of these streams we've been doing, have been me learning things rather than teaching things. We've just kind of gone through stuff together. Um... But, yeah, you don't really know something until, or at least I don't know, feel I know something until I can teach it, and until I can say it and actually believe what I'm saying. And when people have questions, get around it. And I'm definitely not at that space with this yet. Um, just want to yeah so i just want to read this little bit again and i'm going to go back up to the graph and see if i can apply it um i actually want to turn on the uh the doodling device as well let's just go down here and do it down here come on chris um okay so hopefully nice Good, so that'll be there in a minute when I need it. Oops, turn that off. Okay. Because monitors always displayed uh, colors with gamma applied in sRGB space, whenever you draw, edit, or paint a picture on the computer, you are picking colors based on what you see on the monitor. This effectively means that all the pictures you create or edit are not in linear space, but in sRGB space. Um, yeah, your doubling brightness is based on what you perceive and not the actual value of the red component. As a result, um, all of the textures that get created are in, in sRGB space. So if we use those textures as they were in our rendering application, we have to take this into account. Right. It's them being in that sRGB space that I've got to get in my head. So which way is it? So. When we applied gamma correction, we were making things brighter. And that's the thing I'm trying to get around my head is this is the relationship between brightness that humans and, and your CRT and, and humans perceive, right? So am I saying this is value versus um, kind of perceived versus, so I guess this is perceived Oops. And this is, uh... yeah, this is your eyes response to perceive, right? Is this correct? Okay. So the screen raises things to the power of 2.2, which darkens them and makes things look more correct. Um, so yeah. 2.2 to the raise to the power of 2.2 is this guy down here. So this is our perceived, and this is physical, which is rather annoying. Um, and let's say... Yeah, perceived versus actual. So doubling or input, whatever we want to say, input power or power or physical, they're all P's for fuck's sake. Anyway, so if somebody wants to, they're perceiving this color here. Let's just find something that's convenient. So they're perceiving something with a brightness of, where's something that's near to two? Here we go, point two here. So when they're perceiving something that's... What am I doing? Oh, it's Alt. Alt is bringing down that top menu. That's rather annoying. Let's just... Uh, what have I got here that does... There we go. Blue. Control is blue. Nice. Right. So they're perceiving something that's got a brightness, say, of 0 0.2. Arbitrary amount. And they want to brighten it till it's 0 0.4 perceived brightness up here. So this was just under, near as damn it, 0 0.5 here. So 0 0.49 or something like this. 0 0.49. And 
to get it to be twice the perceived brightness, it ends up being around 0.65 or 66. So the actual brightness, like the relationship there, that's way less than double. Uh, but to people, that's perceived as a doubling in brightness. Okay. Now, the bit that I'm trying to work out is they're saying that effectively everything's gamma corrected because people are working in uh, in that space. That's kind of strange to me because, like, to to fix textures we read out of a file, we raise them to the power of two point two, right? And that's the bit I'm trying to... If people are working in this space and we wanted to get to linear... Um, you would raise it, to the power, raise it to this power again. That would get us from here to linear. right? And then doing it again gets us from linear to this inverse gamma... This is our gamma corrected thing. So when the screen transforms it, it's going to go back this way. Which is a power of um, 1 over 2... Point, sorry, a power... Oh, which is being raised to the power of 2.2. .2. So basically, power of 2.2 .2 is in this direction, and power of uh, 1 over 2.2 .2 is this direction, as far as I can figure it in my head. So I want to know why images are being stored in this fashion. Um, let's, you know what, rather than that other article, let's just jump to Wikipedia quickly. And This is like, it's not necessary to... Um, so, gamma correction. Here we go. Oh wait, this is this is Sigra. So used to Wikipedia being at the top. Anyway. Um da 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 da. And then storage. Right, so, when a photographic film is exposed to light, the result of the exposure can be represented on the graph showing a lower exposure in the horizontal axis, and density or log of transmissions on the vertical axis. For a given film formulation, yada, yada, yada. Um, negative film typically has a gamma less than one. Positive film has typically has a gamma greater than one. Um, photographic film has a much greater ability to record fine dif distances, differences in shade. That's kind of like dynamic range stuff, I guess. Um, digital cameras record light using electronic sensors that usually respond linearly. Okay, so the sensor is going to respond linearly, which means that twice as much light hitting the sensor is going to be a twice as high value. But we know that eyes are not going to like that. <laughs> so it's going to need to be transformed. I suppose the monitor is going to do that anyway. You can store it. Um, yeah, when you display it on the monitor, the monitor is going to do that. Um, apply that gamma curve, but it's going to give you something that makes sense. In the process of uh, rendering linear raw data to conventional RGB data, for storage into JPEG image format, color space transformations and rendering transformations will be performed. In particular, almost all standard RGB color spaces and file formats use a non-linear encoding, a gamma compression of the intended intensities, primary colors, bloody hell. So, so this is saying that our, camera, our cameras and stuff um, going from raw to um, like RGB and JPEG and stuff like that, to be used in JPEG and stuff, are doing some kind of gamma transformation on them, a gamma compression. Well, that makes sense to a degree, I guess. It's, um... Power law for video display. Here we go. Just going to see what's going on in chat. 
Holmer Grimm's just giving some support. Thank you, sir. Yeah, this is... If this is a stream about programming, this is someone learning how to do this stuff. This is our job, is to acquire this knowledge and then apply it. That's what we do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really like it. it. I really like it actually on... It's, so it's, it's hypocritical. It feels weird when you're doing it on a stream. But I watch Jake's streams, like Ferris's streams, when he's doing the... Uh, um, emulators and that involves going through a lot of spec sheets you just read that spec and it is terse <laughs> and you just have to go through and work out all the cpu timing stuff and it gets done but it's uh yep but i really want to grok this before we go into the hdr stuff we'll probably have a look at it in a minute i don't want to go on this for too much longer because i think it's going to take a little bit longer to sink into my head anyway um, Median saying that Cambridge and Color link from uh, the other page explains it very well as well. So we'll have to actually have to have a look at that. Okay, so on most displays, okay, so a gamma char characteristic and power law relationship that approximates the relationship between encoded luma in a television system and actual desired image of luminance. Cool. Equal steps in encoded luminance correspond roughly. Um, to subjective equal steps in brightness. It's okay. So it's the difference between a scale, this is again the scale we've been seeing before. Linear encoding versus linear intensity. On most displays, those with gamma of 2.2, one can observe that a linear intensity scale has a large jump perceived brightness between the values of 0 and 0 0.1, um, while the steps at the higher end of the scale are hardly perceptible. But yes, absolutely. 0 0.7 and 0 0.8 look very similar here, where this seems to have a better stepping. Um, the gamma encoded scale, um, sorry, linear encoded linear intensity, um, which has the non-linear increasing intensity, will show much more even steps in the perceived brightness. Cathode ray tube, for example, converts a signal to light in a non-linear way because the electron gun, yeah, just qualities of the electron gun here. Okay. For a CRT, that gamma, um, the gamma that relates brightness to voltage is usually in the range 2.35 to 2.55. Da, 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 da. For simplicity, we talk about 2.2. To compensate for this effect, the linear transfer function is sometimes applied to the video signal so the end um, to end-to-end -end response is linear. The transmittance signal is deliberately distorted so that after being distorted again by the display device, the viewer sees the correct brightness. The inverse of the function above is blah. So, yes, things are stored in a fucked up way so that our fucked up eyes can see them correctly. Um, but at that because the relationships are then non-linear, if we want to do math on those, uh, we're going to have to tr make them linear. So we do raise things to the power of two point two, which fixes the well, fixes the makes them puts them in linear space. Um, then we can do a bunch of stuff on them, but we know the monitor is going to do is going to have this warping again, so it's going to fuck it up on the way out. So we have to fuck it up in the opposite direction so that uh, when it gets fucked up by the monitor, it's nice and straight. You get a linear relationship between those values. Um, and that means not like a doubling in the number actually looks like a doubling in... Yes, doubling in the number is actually going to look like a doubling of brightness which otherwise it would not. Cool, so at least we know that the capture devices do this as well. Which means if, if like if uh, JPEG and all that are storing in a fucked up way, 
then everything yeah everything that you're working with all the image software that you're working with is doing that um, transformation as well so that's the really important takeaway from this article was uh, da -da 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 -da. almost all standard RGB color spaces and file formats use a non-linear encoding um, which is important that means we know that the values we're reading from the file are pre-fucked up um, and I guess they're pre-fucked up this way yes that's it when you save it in the file it's fucking up in this direction so that when it's displayed the values um, have the linear quality that we expect I think that's right yeah, you get linear response. This is always the bit that I just like, oh, I just get stuck in my head. It's like, is that correct? Um, I think so. A lot of the sRGB standard gamma expansion non-linearity in red and the local gamma value slope in log log, log space in blue. Don't want to dig into that yet because that seems like it's going to screw me up even more. Right, let's go back. Back, 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 back. Um, why does it look like this not, is not updating? Whatever, doesn't matter. Let's go down here and we'll just keep going with this. I, I think it's just worth, even if we spend all uh, stream on this, I think it's fine. Um, let's have a look anyway. It will be fine. Oh, that's nice. Keep it going. Right. Oh. That's a different direction than I was expecting. Okay, let's start this up then. Okay, so eyes do not perceive what light the way cameras do. With a digital camera, when twice the number of photons hit the center, it receives twice the signal. So if it's, you get a load of photons hitting it, and it's at 0.1, twice the number of photons is going to give us 0.2. Grand. So actual luminance and is like going to give our camera, like doubling of actual luminance is going to give us a double value on our camera sensor. Great. Um, we perceive that the light is only being a fraction brighter and increasing, increasingly so for higher light intensities. So this is how our eyes respond to it. Like if we see this value, like going from um, zero to 25% uh, brightness. So yeah, going up a quarter of the scale, we jump from zero to well over like 60%. So that's a huge jump in that small part of the input, like small change in input large response um, on our output. So our eyes are weighted to handle these darker areas quite well. And again, probably for survival reasons. Da -da -da -da. It's non-linear, curvy. Reference tone, select. I feel like I'm, because I've uh, disabled some things, let's just do this and anything else that nah, should be fine right okay this is perceived how we perceive uh, things to be this is we like if this is max then this is half according to our eyes but according to the camera this is 50% okay cool Compared to the camera, which much more sensitive to changes in dark tones than we um, are to similar changes in bright tones. There's biological reason for this. It's to enable to our vision to operate over a broader range of luminance. Oh, that's interesting. Otherwise, the typical range of brightness we encounter outdoors would be too overwhelming. That's nice. But how does this relate to gamma? Well, in this case, gamma is what translates between our eyes, light sensitivity, and that of the camera. When digital image is saved, it's gamma encoded so that twice the value in the file more closely corresponds to what we perceive as being twice as bright. Cool. So we think 
that this here is twice as bright. Let's see, 75 is way down here. Yeah, so we think this is twice as bright as this. So from 30 to 50, we, we think that's twice as bright. Um, did I read that right? <laughs> yeah, 35 maps to... No, wait a second, what am I doing? 75%, 35 Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm reading that completely wrong. Okay. Yeah, sorry. We think that this point here is halfway to here, perceptually. So that's really fucked up. So what the cameras are doing in all the file formats, they're warping the results to match how our eyes would see things. And then storing it like that. Okay, I think that's all right. Um, Camera encoded images store tones more efficiently. Um, yeah, because we can use more bits for the parts that our eyes see well and less bits for the parts that our eyes don't detect well. Um, that can be handy. Okay. So despite all these benefits, gamma encoding adds a layer of complexity to the whole process. Yes. And a record um, of recording and displaying images. The next step is where most people get confused. Hello. I'm most people, apparently. So take this part slowly. A gamma encoded image has to have gamma correction to apply when it is viewed, which converts it back into light from the original scene. In other words, the purpose of the gamma encoding um, is for recording the image, not for displaying the image. Fortunately, this second step... Um, the display gamma is automatically performed by your monitor and video card. Nice. So that's what our monitor is doing. So it happened automatically by the CRTs, but now uh, um, LCDs do this deliberately. Okay. So the original scene luminance, yes, this was this around here, gets fucked up into this curve because that's what our eyes respond to. And so like, we can store things more efficiently doing this. Um, okay, so this is in a file format. This is better. Right. Okay, wait a second. JPEG is viewed on a computer monitor. Blam, we put the inverse curve on it. And that the net effect is we get a linear... Uh, representation. Cool. Here we go. Let's go through this again. Image gamma. This is applied either by your camera um, or development software when a captured image is converted into a JPEG or TIFF file. It redistributes the native camera tonal levels into ones which are more perceptually uniform. Okay, so it smushes up the color. The, uh, yeah, it distorts the colors to make them match basically how we see. Um, it's useful because we can use more bits on the parts of the image which we actually are sensitive to. Um, display gamma. This re uh, refers to the net influence of your video card and di on and display device. Um, the main purpose of the display gamma is to compensate for the files gamma, thereby ensuring that the image isn't unrealistically brightened when displayed in your screen. Um, and that's why we would see things washed out when we originally did our raise to the power of 2.2. Sorry, raise to the power of 1 over 2.2. Right, and then system gamma, which is the last bit. This represents the net effect of all gamma values that have been applied in the image. It's also referred to as viewing gamma. For faithful reproduction of the scene, this should ideally be as close to a straight line as possible. Okay, so we are trying to get light out of the monitor in the same amounts that went into the camera in the first place. But when they went into the camera, we transformed them in a way um, to make it, m to put like, yeah, to make it more efficient to store, to have more, to use more bits where there's more eye sensitivity. But because it's been stored, stored in this nonlinear, in this warped way, 
when we display we have to compensate for that and everything um, and as like graphics people where we've got both ends of the problem we're both consuming files which are warped and we have to um, deal with the fact that the monitor is trying to compensate for the fact that things have been warped and so is warping in the opposite direction so if we de-warp things to do math we then have to warp them <laughs> the other way again um, so they can be used cool right that actually makes a lot of sense thank you metian that was really 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 the link i needed I actually should have read this this is a this was a better article actually for uh, getting this thing it's nice that this was related to opengl though um it's, i don't understand quite what's going on with this thing right copy link location shove that here right so back up to the top again this is our eyes response up here to color this top one is how our eyes behave not this one that's where i've been fucking up this is how our eyes behave so we as brightness increases as the number of photons come in uh, we get a lot more response down this end and it flattens out out here and that uh, according to the other article uh, was to do with uh, making sure we were sensitive at the right parts of um, the right kinds of brightness ranges that we're accounting in the world in real life um, because we've got a non-linear sensitivity there's no point storing images in a way that gives equal amounts of, uh, of memory to all parts of the color spectrum because we're not as perceptive in certain parts of the color spectrum so we can redistribute things um, to store things more efficiently so we warp stuff this is the line of how the power that comes into the camera we warp it up to this curve so we do the gamma correction when we store images in the first place um, so it's the to the power of 1 over 2.2 going this direction um, let's just do that again so when we're storing we go this way cool but then um, something that was done automatically by old CRTs and now deliberately by our LCDs is that it's going to warp things the other way we've got this curve we want a, a linear representation again the amount of photons coming out um, to be correct for the original scene so it warps it this way and it does it using this curve um, we want to work in this linear space and we want to put things out in a way that's correct for eyes so yeah like yeah we won't basically yeah, have things linear so when we load in we have to raise the power of 2.2 uh, which we can either do manually whoops or we can use those srgb textures which gets us into linear space then we do all our processing, yay, doing things. And then we push it out to here again um, because uh, the final step when the monitor gets it, it's going to do this transform back to linear here. So it's really just down to, yeah, eye sensitivity and storing things efficiently. That's why you would want to fuck up an image in a certain way because um, it's better for people. And that's interesting. okay so with that where are we where are we i have no idea now um we will take a look at the last 10 minutes at um hdr and we'll really get into that next week so that's oh yeah this site's all weird and javascripty cool and it matters because if you're not correctly if you're not gamma corrected before you do stuff everything you do is going to look wrong anytime you start fucking with light in any kind of way it's going to be incorrect just because the values that you're working with are incorrect to start with so it's really important that we go through this step um yeah to, to make sure we're working with things correctly because we're gonna be gamma correcting from now on so whew, that took me a while how about you guys how long did it take you to get to grok that stuff because it was like every time I would get something right in my head, it would just kind of slide away from me again. I would love to hear how quickly you guys uh, get on this, or if you've worked with this stuff before. Like, what's your, what's your kind of experience with this stuff? And while you're typing, I'm going to start reading on this. So we're going to be looking at HDR, which is cool. So basically, uh, this bit I feel a bit more comfortable with. 
um, our output formats that we've been doing, our standard uh, frame buffer um, and all that kind of stuff, um, we have 8-bit uh, components. So RGB um, are all 8-bit values, 0 to 255 or 0 to 1 for our normalized floats, right? Um, and that's, again, a certain amount of precision, but it's not a very large range. Um, and real life, there's, we've got huge ranges of brightness. Um, like the sun puts out such an massively intense amount of light compared to like a light bulb I've got in this room. We're working on completely different spectrums. Um, spectrum is an awkward, the wrong word to use there. But anyway, different scales of things. Um, so yeah, like if you try and use a value that's higher than one, um, in like or higher than two five five, essentially, it's going to get clamped. So we get clamp between zero and one all the time. Um, but that means that when we start multiplying brightness, which we're going to go and do now, let's go to our render file here, where we were doing lighting. Um, you can see here, this is how we were doing our lighting, super basic. So we took the dot product between the, the uh, like so, get our doodler out again, uh, nine, there we go. So we have a light up here. It's actually a uniform light coming in um, from like a, ma a massive plane at infinity, but everything's coming in the same direction. And we take, we have a normal coming from our object and then a direction to that light. Um, we take the dot product uh, between the two and we give the, uh, basically we do some shading based on that value. Um, so we, you can see here, we get the dot product, which gives us a value between 0 0.1, sorry, not 0 and 1. Uh, we saturate, sorry, we gives us value, um, we saturate it to make sure it's between uh, 0 and 1. We, um, and then we multiply it by the strength of the light. Uh, so what I'm going to do, just so it shows up a little better on the stream, is I'm going to change the uh, clear color. Let's have a look. Clear color um, to be something a lot darker. No point. Uh, yeah. Fuck it. Point seven. Oh, what am I doing? No. Sorry. Brain's going. That wasn't enough either. How's that looking on the stream? That's okay, cool. Right, we're gonna do that and then I'm gonna just up this um, point light strength. So we up it to two, to four, and we're gonna start getting very soon, the, well, you can see it actually a lot on the plane, but values, like we're starting to hit uh, a brightness of, of one in a lot of places. And then everything just gets clamped. We just get white. We can't go any higher. And obviously that's not how not how things work in real life. Our eyes obviously can respond to brightness and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but there isn't just some finite amount of light that can hit an area. So we've got this artificial limitation just by the, uh, by the bit depth. Tired of go saying Lisp is 2017. Well, I'll be staying there then. Um... Where's Erlang, by the way? Just so I know where I am roughly on the timeline. Um, so what we'd like to do is rather than just representing um, our, like our color values um, in an 8-bit value, how about we use a much higher bit depth uh, than we can actually display? And then when we come to display it, we'll squash it down in some sensible way so we keep the parts of the, the, um, the light range that we're interested in. And then using this larger value, I believe, is what is called high dynamic range. And then low dynamic range is what we're, our monitors are actually capable of uh, showing to us. So that transform is going to be, I believe, called tone mapping, which we're going to get into here. So let's have a look. Um, brightness and color values by default clamped uh, between 0 and 1. We're installed in the frame buffer. Um, this is all right, but what happens when we have uh, walk in a specifically bright area with multiple bright lights? Uh, so the sum exceeds 1. The answer is that all fragments have a, um, a color sum of 1 and get clamped. Sorry, all the ones that have the value over one get clamped to one, uh, which ends up looking kind of shitty. So, um, yeah, things just look fake and, and wrong. 
So we could reduce the strength of the lights, but that's no good either. That's, I mean, that's one way of compensating for these things. You would have your artists go and correct all the lighting so it just kind of looked roughly right. But then you're having to fudge things in every different scene. You go to a different environment and suddenly all your textures are going to respond differently. Um, because we're having to mess with the lights just to get things to correct. This is, again, like with the um, gamma correction stuff, we, can't, we couldn't use a physically based attenuation uh, because everything was like the values were incorrect. Um, so we, as soon as we compensated for that, we can use those things. So we want to be able to use more realistic math and then um, deal with that inside this. Anyway, sorry, getting away with myself here. Um, this isn't a good solution as it forces you to use unlist realistic lighting parameters. That's the crux there. Monitors are limited to display colors in the range 0 to 1 or 0 to 2 5, whatever the kind of color space you're using. Uh, but there is no limitation in lighting equations. By allowing fragments to exceed one, we have a much higher range of color values available to work with um, in what is known as high dynamic range. With high dynamic range, really bright things can be really bright, dark things can be really dark, and the details can be seen in both. Magic! How can we get this? Um, so, yes, commonly used in photography, you can take different pictures with different exposure levels, and then you can combine them in smart ways, so you can get all the qualities, like you can get the uh, qualities of the captured in the, the um, low exposure scene, the high exposure scene, you can bring them together. Um, this is also very similar to how the human eye works and is the basis for high dynamic range rendering. Uh, when there is a little light, the human eye adapts itself so darker parts are, more, are better visible and similarly for bright areas. So it's your your, uh, what is it, iris contracting and stuff like that. So high dynamic range works a bit like that. We allow for much larger range of colors and then we are gonna remap them uh, back from, transform from the HDR values back to a low dynamic range of zero to one. So LDR is our normal stuff, HDR is what we're gonna do. And converting between HDR and LDR is known as tone mapping. And we're gonna look into tone mapping and we can see when we start looking at tone mapping functions, which I've done previously, not on a stream though, um, we see that the gamma correction component is often baked in there. Um, so that's kind of interesting. These tone mapping algorithms often expose a parameter that selectively favors light, uh, dark or bright regions. And that's how we're gonna parameterize the kind of response to our, our eyes and stuff like this. Um, Matty Ann is asking for a push. We will do that. And I won't do it from this computer. I don't know why I switched monitors there. That was dumb. Um, I won't push it broken. I'll just switch this back to one. And uh, actually, Matty Ann, the, uh, there's been no change since uh, I just set this one to 100. I don't think that's worth uh, pushing on its own. So, because it's going to freak people out if they start it up and just go, oh, this is fucked. But yeah, watching the video, then you can see we fuck it up deliberately for reasons. Okay. As monitors only display colors, blah, 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 um, in zero to one, we do need to transform the current high dynamic range of colors back into the monitor's range. Simply retransforming the colors back with a simple average still wouldn't do as much good uh, because, yeah, I mean, like our eyes, like, we have different responses to things. We don't want to just do a, like a squish of the color um, that's just going to look weird or it just does look weird. Um, so we're going to have to be smarter about it. Different equations and or curves. Yeah, I suppose those, you can be, say those are separate. Uh, to transform the HDR value back to LDR, that gives us complete control over a scene's brightness. This is the process denoted um, as tone mapping and the final step of HDR rendering. So like I say, they're saying this is the final step, but the, obviously the um, gamma correction is the final step, and we're going to see that it's kind of in there as well. So we need to be able to make floating point frame buffers. Um, and again, that's like our float with our floating point textures. So when you make a frame buffer, you put a texture inside it to render into that texture or a render buffer if you want to do that. That's a separate topic. Um, so you need to be able to make textures um, that are of this higher range. And for that, we're just going to use floats. I mean, like we're saying here, floating point frame buffers. And that's really easy. Uh, actually, we did it earlier in the stream. So we just say the element type is going to be a VEC, VEC3 or a VEC4. Um, in GL, we would say this is an RGBA um, 16F, 
for a 16-bit floating point. Um, or you can make a, this will be a 32-bit one. Um, so these, this guy and this guy are equivalent. Uh, no, they're not because we've got an A in there as well, sorry. And this is a VEC3. So if that was a VEC4, these, these two would be equivalent. Um, and this is a 16-bit, so a half float, um, which is also supported in Keppel. Um, you can use that there. And obviously you can either um, make an FBO um, with just saying list. Oops. See, that's the Erlang fucking me up. I'm having to write things differently. So saying that the first color component is going to be that last texture. And now we've got an FBO with a single attachment. And that attachment, if we go and get it, is going, sorry, yeah, if we go and get that attachment, is going to be uh, this texture. Um, the other way you can do it is um, you can describe the whole thing here. So you can say element type um, is RGBA. Oh, it's RGBA. Let's just do an RGB one. RGB 16-bit. Um, I don't know, for output, we might want an RGBA. There we go. So let's do that. And let's also make a depth attachment. Um, we can just say D, I think. Yeah, there we go. By default, unless you spec specify um, dimensions, it's going to take the dimensions of the current viewport, uh, which you can get from the current... Come on now. That's not how you do it, and you know it. Um, five. Current viewport has a resolution that you can query with, uh, what's it, viewport resolution. So this will be the resolution of uh, that FBO we created here. So if we just go and um, copy to REPL, bring it down here, and go and inspect that value. Um, actually, we'll just do, we'll query the attachment of that last thing. We will get the first color binding from that. And you can actually, oh yeah, all the values are here. That's great. You can see that it's a GPU array, which is backed by a texture um, with this element type and with these dimensions. So that was taken from this. You can also specify dimensions um, when you're defining things right here, just in the same way. Basically, it allows you to take the same arguments you would normally pass to make texture. So that's fine. So that's easy to do from Keppel as well. Um, the default frame buffer um, of OpenGL takes only up to 8 bits per color component. With a floating point frame buffer, we get 32 bits. So obviously, get yeah, much higher ranges of numbers um, that we can use. Um, 32 bits isn't really necessary unless you need a really high level of pre precision. So using the half floats will be totally fine. Um, And so now we know that if we render things into that floating point frame buffer, they're not going to get clamped. Um, so they're not going to get stuck between 0 and 1. You can use negative numbers. You can use positive numbers. It's regular floats, right? So we don't have to worry about that. Um, and so this is just pushing some colors in, apparently. What's going to happen here is we've got a, um, we're going to be reading from a sampler. And even though it's floats, obviously, this is when we get to the final fragment color, whatever we put in here is going to get clamped to zero and one. It doesn't matter how big the values are in here. We're allowed to store them, but to display them, it's still going to clamp them. So we get exactly the same result as we were originally. So that's no good. Um, so then we have to do that remapping process known as tone mapping. And that is basically where we're going to kick off next week. So we're going to do a very, very brief summary of what we just talked about. We'll just dive straight into this. Um, and we'll be seeing how we can, yeah, mess with these colors and hopefully do it with this scene. So thank you very much for staying around. I hope that was, uh, I hope that was interesting. I'd still love to hear from you on like how, how you found that process, even though for those of you who are um, watching on, on YouTube, let me know how you found this stuff to understand because it's... Uh, it's one of these ones, I've done this a couple of times, and I, I walk away from it thinking, yeah, I've got this, I've got it, it's fine, no problem. And then I end up, it just slips. I think, I'm not sure if it's just because I'm not using the information. Um, 
I don't know, but we need to put this in practice and then I'm hoping it's going to stick. That's where we are. Thanks so much for watching. Um, I will now give it a couple of seconds while I get some drink. And if, uh, if there's any other questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, we're done. Thanks, Acrium. Glad it was uh, glad it was good. Cheers, Marianne. All right, let's call this a night. Thanks so much, folks, and uh, yeah, see you next time, or I'll see you next time as soon as my mouse gives me that control. Ciao.